Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. This happened in Trinity County. Some friends and I had come home late from a dance and were sitting in the house tuning a guitar when all of a sudden we heard this loud wail or cry coming from outside. It was cold, but there was no snow yet. We went outside on the porch and could still hear this piercing wail. It stopped and started again as we tried to tell where it was coming from. Across from the old house was some rock bluffs about 80 yards up the hill. The sound seemed to come up atop these bluffs. The cry started at a lower key and rose in pitch and intensity and lasted at least a couple of minutes. We got scared and went back in for the night and locked all the doors. The next morning, Arden and I went up on the bluff and found a cleared area about 30 feet across. The small trees had been pulled out of the ground and thrown to the side. Everything else had been trampled down flat. The ground was too hard for tracks, but there was a hard smell in the area. My neck still feels funny when I think about the call. Three of us heard the screams and two of us explored the area. Bigfoot has always been part of the folklore of this whole area. It was about two or three in the morning and very cold. It was at the foot of the Grizzly Mountain in Hillside Ranchland, Rocky Bluff, and separated stands of pine and hardwoods with lots of grassy bulbs. On to the next one. This happened in Humboldt County. I was below our house and used to go down to the spring and just hang out. I got halfway down and looked across, and there was this big ape in my mind looking at me. It is still so clear of that moment. I do not know that I left first, and I never said a word to anyone I saw. Years later, our house burned down, and we moved to Eureka. When my sister and I became adults, I told her what I saw that day, and she started crying. She had experienced that same thing, only she was down at the spring and he was above her on the log. I moved back to that property as an adult, built a new home, and everything was fine. I lived there with my son at the time, whoever needed a place. That fall, everyone pretty much left, and as the nightly custom, I would build a fire and my son and I would sit around it and eat. We had no electricity or anything. That hillside always rang with birdsong. Never a quiet moment. That night, there was a silence, and a weird feeling came over me like eyes were watching. I grabbed my son and a few clothes, and we hiked down to the nearest house. I never went back there to live. It scared me that bad. There's a lot more stories I could tell you about this mountain, but I will leave that for later. I know what I saw that day, and I know the feeling that I had years later. I would like to say that this was 40 acres that I grew up on and had always felt safe. After that night, I left. I never got that feeling back again. Something changed. The birds never sang like before either. On to the next one. Jim and Jan Gorell were having a nighttime barbecue when they noticed that they were being watched. What was watching them was a 9 to 10 foot tall Bigfoot. This was at Bowen's Ranch near Mount St. Goronio in San Bernardino County, California. The couple left hurriedly. On to the next one. In Humboldt County, me and four other boys had found an old logging cabin about three miles up in the woods from Myers Flat and used this old shelter for several summers. One night, the last one, we were all camping for the weekend in this old place that we had fixed up. 
After cooking the evening meal, we had all eaten and went to bed. Sometime during the night, I was awakened by a huffing sound. I awoke one of the other boys, and we listened to something slowly working its way all around the outside of the cabin. We woke up the three others, and we all listened. Whatever it was outside was poking at the old rotted boards around the bottom of the shack. We could hear it shuffle around and pry at some of the boards. Finally, it moved around to the front door, which was only about five feet high, and Butch got my old twenty-two rifle and said, Open the door. I did not want to open the door, but did anyways. Whatever it was was standing right in front of the opening, but because it was dark, all we could see were hairy legs. Butch fired the twenty-two, and this thing screamed and spun around and took off. Needless to say, we were scared to death. We heard two or three heavy thuds, and then everything went quiet. We tried to sleep, but ended up huddled together in the middle of the floor the rest of the night. The next morning, we went out as a group and searched the ground. There was a Torah place where this thing had spun around, and about three or four indentations in the ground where it took off. There was no blood on the ground anywhere. We packed up and never went back. There were five boys, ages 16, 17, and 18. It was sometime early morning before dawn. On to the next one. In Sutter County in California, I lived at a house by the levee in my childhood years. Immigrants had a shack against the levee and always had a gather for the weekend. One day, my mom was out to show the men how she could shoot her new twenty-two Ruger rifle at tin cans. After all the fun, a man was just having an idea if he could just use the rifle on Saturday morning for cottontails. Dad and Mom were happy to let him use it. Saturday came around, and I noticed that the homemade rack with cottontails and jackrabbits hanging upside down near the small cabins to the side of them. My brother told me to go with him and check them out. It was sad to see such a kill. That evening, the men showed my dad how beer batter makes a good rabbit roast over the fire, and we all had a share of the food with wild rice and flour tortillas. This went on for two weeks. Then a problem occurred. Someone was stealing the rabbits from the rack. Since our family was the only one in the camp, we were most likely to blame. My dad was beat up at a card game as beer caused a climax over the rabbit issue, and I could not stand to see it. I was not afraid of anything, cause I never watched any TV in my life about scary stuff, so I had no feeling for that in that direction. I went up the levee to just look around, and I saw a rat snake. I ran down and told mom about the snake. Mom said not to go back up again. It could bite me. But my curious mind took me back up the next day. I walked up the levee, looking down to the right side, where I may have seen it last. When I got to the top, that was it. No snake. Then, in the silence of everything but the soft breeze blowing a bit in my ear, I saw something moving in front of me. Here was this huge monkey-like creature on a cottonwood tree, looking over the levee. I noticed it in the shade of the upper branches because one of its legs was swinging back and forth below the branch. I got closer to adjust my focus on this big creature, and sure enough, it was some sort of ape-like thing, but with a smaller head, and it had human-like features. I looked down to see if there was a fence between us, and there was not any fence at all. My mouth was watering over fear, and I could not move my leg. I found a way to turn around and get off the levee. As I went down the levee, halfway down, I started to run and never looked back. I told my mom about what I saw, and she stopped cleaning and told me to shut and lock the doors. My mom was now thinking of the rabbits that had gone missing and told me food left out makes animals gather more. We never went out over that levee again. Fear after that was something to remember when alone at that age. 
we moved a few years later and never spoke about the huge monkey by the levee again. On to the next one. In Trinity County in California, sometime in January, Bob Kelly and Archie Bradshaw saw Bigfoot. Kelly had shot at the Bigfoot that had looked into a cabin window at 2 a.m. Tracks were found in the area that were not made by a barefoot human or bears. On to the next one. Is Bigfoot vacationing in the southern Nevada desert? The legendary creature, whose activities are normally confined to the Pacific coast, was sighted by a worker in the Nevada test site, 95 miles north of Las Vegas recently. Department of Energy spokesman Dave Jackson said a worker saw the creature walk across a road in the forward area of the test site. It was reported heading east toward Yucca Flat, site of numerous above and below ground nuclear tests. The creature was described as more than six feet tall, covered with hair and walking upright, taking long strides like a man. Jackson said when the unidentified worker reported the sighting, he took quite a bit of ribbing. Jackson said security officials stationed in Mercury investigated but were unable to find any footprint or other evidence. On to the next one. I was a reserve deputy sheriff for Story County Sheriff's Office. I was employed by Houston International Mineral Corporation at Gold Hill as their on-site security supervisor. I'd worked the day shift. I had ran some kids out of the old mill at around 3.30 p.m. I was showing my swing shift officer the area I had ran the kids off from. We were in the security vehicle parked on the high side of the south side of the old mill, gold mining. We saw that the boys, four of them, were running back down the ravine to the creek below. It was 4.15 p.m. As the boys reached the creek, they must have scared a group of girls at the creek bottom because they started screaming. There was a lot of noise being made by both the girls and boys laughing and yelling. At first, I thought they had scared a deer west of them near the rock outcrop. Then I thought, no, it's too big to be a deer. I could see it moving among the trees, heading up the other side of the ravine at a very fast pace. I thought it must be a lone Mustang as I watched. My security officer got the binoculars from the seat and said, oh my god. I looked closer and realized it was not a Mustang. I was looking at a large, graying, brown, man-shaped thing about 10 plus feet tall. It was obviously male because of its build. As it cleared the trees near the top of the hill, I could clearly see it. It was covered with hair from head to toe, graying like a person in their 50s. It was at least three feet across at the shoulders. At the crest of the hill, it turned and looked back down the ravine. It was maybe a hundred yards across the ravine. I had an unobstructed view at this point. It stood on the hilltop maybe a minute, looking back down the hill, then turned and moved to the other side of the hill out of view. We drove over to where we had seen the thing last, about a two-mile drive on dirt roads. It was about 4.50 p.m. By then, we saw no further sign of it, but were able to establish that the thing was standing next to a tree that was 11 feet tall, and it was just as tall as the tree we saw. The only other thing that I noticed was just the noise of the kids down lower on the creek, Happy sounds, not fearful. Screaming and yelling. It was 4.15 p.m. Broad daylight, clear skies. Warm, almost hot. The area is high desert, almost a ravine 60 feet deep, with a rock outcrop on the other side, with a creek in the bottom of the ravine. There are cottonwood trees and willows in the bottom of the ravine, with juniper, sage, and pine trees on both sides of the ravine. 
This opens up into a flat as you move west. The siding was just south of the old American Flats Mill site, below the new mill and mill pond. On to the next one. In Douglas County in Nevada. In September, my friend and I were hiking on the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, above Lake Tahoe and the Carson Valley, above the town of Genoa. Both of us grew up in this area. Although in high school, I was kind of a cut-up. My friend Linda graduated valedictorian of our class five years earlier. She is very logical. We have often hiked this trail that basically goes straight up the mountain and over to Tahoe. It is a strenuous hike. When we parked our truck at the trailhead, there was another car parked there as well. We were a quarter of the way up the trail when two teenage boys came running down the mountain toward us. The trail was extremely steep and they were running for all they were worth. They stopped long enough to implore us not to go any further up the mountain as they had seen a monster or something. There was an old deer hunter's cabin at about the halfway point and we told the boys that we were only going that far. We thought they were drinking or on drugs. We shrugged off the incident laughed and joked that we wished we had what they were smoking. We reached the cabin without incident, sat down on the bluff that overlooked the Carson Valley. We split a soda that we had brought, and I took out my recorder. It's a flute-like instrument, and began playing some little tunes on it. We were alone on that mountain, we thought. After about an hour of putzing around, we decided to head back down the trail. I kept smelling dog dew, or something dead. I even checked my shoes. We were near the creek gathering pine cones for an art project. I was facing downhill. Linda was facing uphill. We were examining a particularly perfect cone when Linda looked up and exclaimed, Oh my God, it's a bear. No, it's a guy in a bear suit. I looked up and couldn't believe it. We were a stone's toss from a seven-foot hairy dude. He looked directly at us, and to this day, Linda and I felt something pass between the three of us. He stood across the creek from us. His hair was the color of dirty pine needles and covered his whole body. With the hair thinning just on his chest and face, he had a large, broad chest, but not breasts like a female. His arms were hanging at his sides, nearly to his knees, and when he walked, he took long strides and his arms swung freely as he walked. He didn't seem to fear us, although he began to walk straight up a pine needle covered slope, barefooted without slipping. As he moved away, Linda grabbed my arm and began dragging me down the hill. I couldn't take my eyes off him, and he never took his eyes off of us. I do not feel to this day as he meant to harm us but instead, I feel he was just as fascinated with us as we were with him. His face seemed almost serene with very intelligent eyes. His face resembled an orangutan. He had large eyes and a flattish nose. I sketched a picture as soon as I got home, and Linda confirmed that I had captured his likeness. I wished I had a camera on me that day. As we continued at a fast pace down the hill, he remained on that ridge above us, paralleling in the same direction. We reached our truck and could see him crouching on a granite boulder at least a football field distance between us. I yelled up to him that he was very cool, but he shouldn't be scaring the crap out of locals. He stood up on his boulder and Linda told me to shut up and get in the truck. We were strangely disturbed that afternoon and evening. We thought of going to the Forest Service or the Sheriff's Department, but criminy sakes, who would believe us? Plus, in our community, they would just want to shoot him. We have since hiked there many times, always hoping to catch another glimpse. We are married ladies with kids, and we take the kids up Bigfoot Canyon periodically in search of our elusive friend. A few years ago, the wind blew down some trees during a storm, and exposed an area that we had not seen from the trail before. 
When we went up to investigate, we found a large boulder and some older pine trees with branches low to the ground around it. You could duck down and go under the trees near the wall of the boulder, and it looked as if something or someone had made a natural shelter there. The pine needles had all been trampled down, and it seemed to be away from the prevailing winds. A great place for deer, bear, or perhaps a Bigfoot. We hope so. I will never look at life on this earth the same way. I have seen Bigfoot, and not only does it make for a great tale around the campfires at night, it fuels my imagination. About every little sound I hear when I'm in the wilderness, I am intrigued. I only hope that no harm comes to the Bigfoot. I believe that the great creator of all life shares the sight of the Bigfoot with people who might grow from the experience. I know Linda and I have both grown. Even if we share the experience with someone who doesn't believe us, it really doesn't matter. We know what we saw. He was so close in proximity. It was obvious to us that this fella belonged here. He was as natural as the sky, creek, trees, and deer. It was a beautiful day. Clear, but a little bite to the air. 2 o'clock p.m., ponderosa pines and cedar, near the foundation of an old deer hunter's cabin and a trickle of a creek. I spoke with an Australian mountain biker who had a strange experience five years ago directly on the other side of the mountain on the Tahoe side. He said he was riding his bike and exercising his German shepherd. He said he kept smelling something dead, said his dog was running ahead of him. Suddenly, his dog yelped and turned around without waiting for him and ran back down the mountain. The man said he never did see anything, but he felt there was someone watching him. And he said he's never felt the hair on his neck and arms prickle. He thought maybe it was a bear, but the smell kept coming back to him. This story was shared with me before I had told my own. On to the next one. In a wooded area near my house at McCord ASB in Pierce County in Washington, I was eight years old and playing in the woods with some friends. I accidentally got separated from my friends and got lost in the woods. While walking down a trail, I got the feeling that I wasn't alone. At first, I thought it was my friends playing tricks on me, so I just continued down the trail. A few minutes later, I hit an odor that to this day I cannot describe, and I heard what sounded like something was growling at me. The growl, or whatever it was, was coming from my left in some thick bushes. I thought that I'd come too close to an animal that was eating some other animal, so I began to walk much faster. That's when I heard the scream. The scream seemed to surround me, so I can only guess that it came from those bushes. I ran out of the woods as fast as I could. I never looked back, so I don't know if whatever it was was following me. I never told anyone about it until my mother and I watched a documentary recently and I heard a recording of what was supposed to be a Bigfoot growling or mumbling. It was the same noise I heard that day. I can't say for sure that I was that close to a Bigfoot, but it sounded just like that recording I heard on TV. I don't know if any of my friends heard the scream. I was too scared and I never brought it up with anyone. On to the next one. Near Trout Lake in Klickitat County in Washington. I was nine years old. It was between 8 and 9 a.m. on the day Mount St. Helens blew its top. My family was going to get some white landscape rocks from a rock pit west of Trout Lake, Washington. We were on Highway 141 in the Ice Caves area. I saw a Bigfoot run across the highway. It took him two steps to get across the highway. I also noticed Mount St. Helens erupting and the smell of sulfur in the air. My parents did not see him. 
on to the next one. This was in Kagit County in Washington. I had taken my kids for a drive on Mother's Day in the mountains east of Big Lake, Washington. As we came around a bend in the dirt road, we saw something at a distance crossing the road to head up the mountain. It saw us, stopped to look at us, and then ran back down into the brush and disappeared. It was almost all black, with no variation in color. It was not a bear, nor a human. No other human activity in that area that day. A local ranger stated that there was 50 miles of wilderness in any direction. There were three of us that saw it. I was driving, coasting. I had one son on the hood who saw it, and another son in the car who saw it. Two other sons did not see it. It was afternoon, sunny and dry, forest on either side of the road, with thick brush going down the right side of the road and trees on the left side going up. On to the next one. On Mount Pew, which lies between Monte Cristo and Darrington in Snohomish County in Washington, my partner and I summited early in the afternoon of an overcast day. The familiar ascent had been particularly interesting in that we passed a herd of mountain goats with young that were grazing in the Cirque Meadow. We had also seen several marmots. After lunch and a nap on the summit, we started down. We had descended through the pass and were picking our way through boulders about halfway down the Cirque when I turned and looked back up to where we had been a few minutes earlier. I noticed movement in the path. A large, dark, human-like form stood up and looked directly down at us. I stopped and asked my partner, who was ahead of me, what's that figure up in the path? Neither of us spoke as we watched the form. The situation was very odd because we knew there was no one else on the upper mountain. Familiarity with the area and subsequent research indicate that there are no other routes to the path it would be impossible to miss other hikers on the narrow, exposed trail, not to mention the fact that, at the outset, ours was the only vehicle parked at the trailhead. As we watched the form begin to vigorously wave its unusually long arms up and down and over its head, on speaking later of this odd behavior, both my partner and I had clearly interpreted it to mean, get the heck out of here, as opposed to, hello there, the gesture was definitely felt as menacing. Although I thought of the camera in my pack, I was reluctant to take my eyes off the figure for fear I would miss something. We watched, transfixed for a few more seconds until low cloud moved in to cover the path. We continued down through the woods to the trail ahead and as when we had arrived, Ours was the only vehicle at the trailhead. Here are my afterthoughts. What we saw was not a bear. Its arms slash front legs were way too long. It was not a human because we were the only one there. In addition, the behavior seems very bizarre when applied to a human form. If someone were trying to get our attention, a shout would have made a lot more sense. Pew is a rugged 7,224-foot peak in the northern Cascade. A trail to the summit begins at 1,920 feet, passing through dense, rainforest-like woods, and climbs steadily for about five miles before emerging from the trees in a boulder-strewn alpine cirque. By following a steep switchback up to a notch called Dujack Pass at 5,720 feet, the rim of the cirque is reached, which leads by way of an exposed bridge to the summit pyramid. On to the next one. It was the summer of 1979, or maybe 1980. My friend and I hiked up the Mount Jupiter Trail to go fly fishing at one of the Jupiter Lakes which I think might be referred to as number two. You drop down over the ridge to the north before getting to the summit of Mount Jupiter, 
to reach the first three of five lakes, I believe. There is no trail to the lake, so you must drop over the ridge to get down to the first lake, sometimes hanging on to a bit of brush. There are three lakes on this side. We got to the first, followed the outlet, and went and camped at the second lake down. I think we stayed two nights. It was probably the second day when this incident happened. There were some other guys that had camped on the other side of the lake and had left at about 2 to 3 p.m., I recall. My time frames are not exactly clear anymore. Nonetheless, the guys that had been camping on the opposite side of the lake had left about three hours previous to what I call a didn't-pay-enough-attention encounter. I was fly-fishing to the shoreline, sort of to the side of the opposite end of the lake. Being an intense fly fisherman concentrating on my fishing, I saw what was. I thought at first that a person had returned to the camp to get something they might have forgotten. I didn't pay any attention because I had remembered that there were people that had camped here. At the moment, while concentrating on fishing, I didn't look directly at the camp, but I saw a figure out of the corner of my eye. It was probably there for a minute or maybe less. Out of the corner of my eye, this figure walked back and forth maybe a couple of times in the area and finally walked with a large stride across the campsite and disappeared into the wood. After it had disappeared, the thought of the stride struck me as odd. It was a big stride, arm swinging, just as the video of Sasquatch that was spotted in the late 1960s down in Eureka, California. After it had disappeared, the oddness of the stride made me look over at the campsite. Then it hit me how very odd it seemed because of the movement and the stride of the figure out of the corner of my eye. I was actually upset for not taking a better look and further upset because I had my camera quite handy at the time. I carry it to take pictures of trout I catch. I don't remember where my friend was at the time since it was a long time ago, but anyway, I told him about it. I said, let's go over there and see if we can find some tracks, so we did. When we got there, we discovered the campsite area was a huge rock mass with moss growing on it. We found no tracks, but we didn't look that hard either. I must say that we could hardly sleep that night. Nothing more unusual happened that I can recall. I had seen the film of the Sasquatch spotting down in a Eureka by the Patterson guy long before this hiking fishing trip. So the swinging of the arms and the stride had sort of stuck in my mind and this thing, whatever it was, had that same movement. Too bad I didn't look straight at it. Too bad I didn't snap a photo. I regret it to this day. I can say that the creature's coloring was a brownish-reddish color. It didn't dawn on me until after the thing disappeared that I didn't see any clothing from the corner of my eye observation encounter. I just thought I should report this after all these years. I never have. I can say that the area is very rugged country and is not easy to get to. The campers on the north side of the lake had come somewhat up from the Doze Wallop River, where I don't know of any trail access, so they must have bushwhacked to get to the lake from that side. It was around 6 p.m., and the weather was clear and sunny. On to the next one. I encountered a Bigfoot in northern Massachusetts when I was at the age of 15. My name is Lori, and it's still something that is a challenge for me to talk and discuss. It wasn't until a family member told me to write down my experience that I started to process everything. I was raised by a single mother, and I'm not afraid to admit that she was a bit of a cat lady. Altogether, I would say we had an average of between 10 to 15 cats at any given time. All of them were outdoor cats that came and went as they pleased. I was quite close to a few of them, and there were also a few that I hardly ever saw. If you've ever owned a lot of cats at once, 
Chances are you know what I'm talking about. One of my favorite cats was this black and white one that I named Nala when I was younger. And yes, it was in honor of my favorite childhood movie, The Lion King. Nala was extremely affectionate, often brushing up against my leg and sleeping in my bed. She didn't sleep in my bed every single night, but it was rare for her to go more than two or three nights without doing so. After Nala had been gone something like four nights without coming to sleep in my bed, I asked my mother if she had seen her anywhere. Mother also thought it was weird. Nala wasn't old at the time, so it made it seem all the more strange. We had a garden in our backyard that wasn't very uncommon for the cats to hang out in. So I had been looking in there every hour or so once I realized that she was missing but no luck. It was probably about a week later that mother called the police because she said she saw a homeless man through the window late in the evening. When I asked her what he looked like, she explained that he was very tall and had long black hair and a long black beard. She said since it was dark, she had trouble seeing much more than that. The first thing that came to mind was a hobo was living near our house and capturing local cats or whatever meat he could get his hands on for nourishment. When the police arrived, neither of them seemed very concerned, and I think they suspected that Mother was a little loopy. Even though I didn't see the perpetrator myself, I pleaded with the two officers to take my mother's words more seriously. But when I explained to them that one of my cats had gone missing, and that the hobo might be to blame. The officers seemed to take things even less seriously than before. They didn't even search the yard with flashlights. They merely said they would keep an eye out and let us know if they found anyone. It was discouraging. Mother might have been an alcoholic, but she was never one to make stuff up or have delusions. I couldn't sleep for the next few nights, I laid in a chair near the window so that I could potentially see the hobo camping near our yard and call the police back over to arrest him when he fell asleep and least expected it. I never saw anything. So I started sleeping in my bed again and just started trying to move on with my life. I would have good days and bad days. The fact was that I really truly loved that cat. Nala was my favorite. One of our other cats had just had a litter of kittens, probably around a month later. They had grown old enough to walk, so I had them out on the back porch, getting some sun while playing inside a cardboard box. Of course, I would never leave them there by themselves, so I was right beside them, keeping close watch, making sure that none of them exited the box and went out into the yard. I'd gotten up for a second to grab a bottle of water from where I'd left it on the railing when suddenly I saw, out of my peripheral vision, a large hairy arm poke its way between the wooden fence that circled the balcony and grabbed one of the kittens. Beyond startled, I turned my head to look at the culprit right as it bit the head off the kitten and chewed it for a moment before swallowing. At first, I assumed it was the hobo, but it only took a few seconds to realize it was not a man. I was looking at an animal I couldn't identify. Its mouth opened so wide while it looked at me and let out this muffled bellow. It was clear that it was attempting to intimidate me from getting any closer to it, but without drawing any attention from anyone else. The kittens were whimpering like crazy. They knew that danger was nearby. Luckily, the sides of the box were too tall for any of them to escape. I was about to scream for help, but I quickly remembered that Mother was out of the house. I quickly looked around for something that I could use to defend myself if it were to attack me. The only thing that was within reaching distance was a hose that we used to water the nearby flowers. The water was still turned on from watering the plants, luckily, so I grabbed it and aimed it at the Bigfoot. It jumped backward before it got hit with the cold water. 
He then growled at me and then used the hand that wasn't holding the kitten's headless body to throw grass and dirt in the air. It seemed like it was extremely agitated that I would blast that hose in its direction. After it took a few moments to throw its tantrum, I watched as it then ran around the other side of the house and out of sight. Once I caught my breath, I ran over to grab the box of kittens, then ran inside, quickly locking the door behind me. I just stood there in the kitchen for a while, trying to calm the kittens and myself down. My heart rate was through the roof. I was so worried that Mother would encounter the Bigfoot on her way back to the house that I called her to warn her. Luckily, she made it home without any complications, and I sat her down to tell her about what I saw. I explained to her that it was no homeless man. It was a rare creature known as Bigfoot. At first, she laughed at me, but then she started to ponder what she had seen a few nights earlier. She then mentioned that the homeless man was moving around the yard in the strangest of ways. She said that she saw him crawling at one point. She said that it would make some sense given the size of the individual that she saw through the window. Still, she couldn't seem to believe it 100%. And how could I expect her to? What I had just experienced was a conundrum right out of a scary movie. It gave me a lot of respect for what so many people must go through on a daily basis. And nobody believes them. Regardless, my mother helped me gather all of our cats over the next few days, and we kept them in the basement until we could decide how to handle this complication. Fortunately, we had a spacious basement. We weren't able to find all the cats, sadly, but it did help me feel more at ease to know where most of them were. Mother called the police again, had them come to our property, and had me try to convince them that I saw an aggressive ape devour one of our kittens. Even though it wasn't the same officers that came out the last time, they still didn't seem to believe either of us that there might be something inhuman near our property. They gave us the same spiel as last time, stating that they would keep an eye out. I respect the police, as I do believe they have a very difficult job, but all of the officers we had dealt with during this frightening time were so disingenuous. I guess you could say we had been dealt a few bad cards. Shortly after the whole incident, we ended up moving in with my grandma, who lived only a few hours away in a town that had a lot more going on. We immediately felt safer, and I don't think I will ever live in a wooded location ever again. On to the next one. Here is a strange hunting experience with my son and an unknown creature. Our adventure starts out like any other hunting season, making sure we are prepared for a few nights stay in our favorite hunting ground in Siskiyou County, California. My son and I go hunting every year and always like to be in the woods for daybreak on opening morning. We had everything in order with one exception, my truck developed a leak in the heater core the night before opening morning of general hunting season. I wanted to replace the heater core, but had no time to do it. With time running short, I believe using some stop leak in the radiator should do the trick, as the leak was very small. It worked, and off we went on our yearly hunting adventure. We arrived near where we were going to be hunting at a very early hour, and decided to get them shut-eye until morning light. Upon waking, we had discovered that while we slept, Mother Nature had lightly deposited a light dusting of snow. Very uncommon for what we have seen around here, as we joke about opening day being the hottest day of the year. We had some coffee and a sweet roll and warmed up the truck to get ready for the day. As it was getting very toasty and warm in the cab, I noticed the smell of antifreeze and the windshield fogged up. Great, I said, another setback to keep us from getting our hunt on. Well, I had brought several more applications of the stop leak just in case, 
and threw one more in the radiator. With the leak now under control, we headed for our chosen spot. A friend at work, we'll call him Jack, likes to frequent the area to fish the two high mountain lakes in the area. Jack had told me that he had spotted three to four nice bucks and recommended we give it a try. After arrival to one of the lakes where I was given the tip, my boy and I loaded up and hiked to the far end of the lake. It was a very crisp morning, some dew in the air, and uncharacteristically extremely quiet. It has been my experience when hunting that I am very in tune with my senses and pay close attention to my surroundings. I would say we were there listening for any sign of our intended game for about 20 to 30 minutes. All of a sudden, this loud thud happened out of nowhere. It was a sound comparable to a very, very large rock being slammed on the ground. We could even feel the reverberation from this unknown blow to the earth 40 to 50 yards away. I looked at my son. He looked at me as if to say, what the heck was that? But sometimes just a look is all that is needed without a spoken word. It drew our attention, so now, instead of hunting, the source of this unwarranted noise was our focus. About five minutes had passed until we spoke to each other without any more noise. The forest was dead quiet. We entertained the idea that it was probably a bear up the hillside foraging for something to eat. Then, all of a sudden, the trees, not small either, started to shake violently accompanied by a holler to the like I've never seen before. To be honest, I was starting to get worried. I played it off to my son, though he undoubtedly looked at me as the only one to remove us from the situation safely. I told him we would just walk around the lake and leave whatever this was and go straight for the truck. Now being located at the far end of the lake as we were, it was so muddy we couldn't get through. We were sinking into the mud. At this point, whatever was up the hill didn't want us there, and to be honest, I didn't want us there either. Keep in mind, we're out deer hunting, both armed with rifles, both 30 sixes, and we both had a sidearm. Mine was a 44 Magnum, and he had a 357 Magnum, and I still didn't feel safe. Whatever this creature was, I no longer thought of it as a bear. It was something else. No bear I have ever heard made the noise we heard coming from the woods up on the hillside. So we would have to walk on the narrow path right by this creature to get back to the truck. I was very apprehensive about this task, but we had no options at this point. I told my son I was going to fire a couple of rounds from my 44 Magnum into the hillside to scare it off before we made our mad dash to the truck. So I said, ready. And he said, yup. Then, boom, boom, I cracked off two rounds and off we went. All was quiet, deadly quiet, almost too quiet for me. Finally, we were back to the truck, safe. So I thought. As we were removing the mud from our boots, to get into the truck, behind me, I heard the sound of snapping branches and an evil roar and holler that made the hair on my neck stand straight out. I just got a chill thinking about it. I turned around to see the trees moving as whatever this was was coming down the hill right toward us, hollering all the way. This creature had waited until we had our gear put away until... I guess it thought about it and was very pissed off before it started down the hill after us. I yelled, get in the truck, and we sped out of there fast. Did we actually experience a Bigfoot encounter? I can't say for certain. Did we actually see it? No. But I can't think of anything else to compare it to. I have never even had an experience like this before or after this one. I can tell you this. I was not sticking around to see what it was. We drove to safety as quickly as possible. 
I'm so thankful that the league stop had done its job at that moment. But our heater core failed later that day. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. I told my friend Jack about our experience, the guy who gave me the tip, and he asked me where did it happen up there. I was starting to tell him, and he said, was it here? He actually told me where before I was able to finish my story. He said he always felt uneasy fishing there like something was watching him. He told me he and some friends were going up there soon and would look around and let me know what he finds. About three days later, Jack reports back to me they found a pile of broken branches about four inches in diameter, all stacked up in a neat pile. These branches were broken, not cut, with a chainsaw. He said he was going back the next weekend with a video camera to document the find. When he returned, the pile was gone. I also told one more close friend about our experience, but before I could finish, he asked the name of the lake. I told him, and his response was that he had a similar experience when he was fishing. He said he was so worried about it, he ran out of there, leaving all of his fishing gear, and he never went back, ever. To this day, I still feel really weird just driving past this little lake. We don't go there anymore. I guess we'll never really know what that was that day, but I know with a certainty it wasn't a bear. I know my story has no actual sighting, but the sounds heard that day will be forever branded in my mind, and as well as my son's forever. I have never told my story publicly, just a close family and a few friends, as I didn't want to be thought of as a wacko. On to the next one. I'm a retired archaeologist with the state of Alaska, where I worked for most of my entire career for the Alaska Office of History and Archaeology, OHA. As you can probably imagine, I've been to more wild places than the average Joe, from the Aleutian Islands to the Bering Straits. I've seen lots of interesting things, had plenty of close calls with bad weather, bears, and even a beluga whale once. But the most memorable event and frightening, I might add, of my entire 14-year career was on Yakobi Island, a place very few even know exist. I generally worked out of headquarters in Anchorage, but would go wherever the job took me. I did a lot of review and compliance work, think oil industry, so spent a lot of my time on the North Slope. But my real love was when I got to actually go to dig site surveys and even help excavate a site, though that didn't seem to happen very often. But I did generally enjoy the travel and exploring the magnificent state of Alaska. There's nowhere like it. Well, this one time, I was down in Juneau for a trial where I'd been asked to be an expert witness for an ongoing legal battle between a group of natives and an oil company. And it looked like it was going to turn into a long stay. So I got interested in doing some sightseeing while there. My family always jokes that for me, sightseeing is spelled S-I-T-E, not S-I-G-H-T, as I always look out for archaeological sites, while of course taking in the scenic sites as well. There would be a week hiatus before I could present the rest of my evidence, which had to do with an oil company wanting to put a haul road right over a sacred site. And I could either fly back home to Anchorage or stay and explore the area. And in case you don't know, there are no roads to Juno. You arrive either by air or ferry, and your car arrives by ferry or barge. So once you're there, you really don't have many places you can go. To this day, a lot of Alaskans wonder why it's the capital of the state, even after there have been several votes to move it, though it never gets done. So I wasn't sure what to do. If I returned, I'd have to work. Whereas if I stayed, I could do whatever I wanted. 
for a week. Kind of a little vacation. Though, one, I couldn't really go anywhere, much because I was in Juno. The idea of staying sounded kind of good on one hand, but on the other, I might get pretty bored and have nothing to do. I can tell you right now that in many ways, I now wish I had gone back to Anchorage and worked. There are some kinds of excitement that aren't worth it. I also knew that I could potentially get stuck there because of bad weather, so I needed to see what the forecast was, though I suspected it called for at least some rain, as it usually does. I don't know if you've ever been to Juneau, but it's basically a rainforest. Because of the Pacific Ocean being nearby, it gets lots of rain, anywhere from 50 to 90 inches a year, and it rains there about 320 days a year. It can get cold in the winter, but not as severe as most of Alaska. Anyway, I decided to wander down to the library and see what I could find out what there is to do in the Juneau area, as well as read some of the history. If it looked interesting, I would stay for the week. If not, I'd fly home the next day. As I'm talking about this, I'm trying to recall when all of this happened. I've been retired about six years ago, so I believe it was probably around 15 years ago. I'm an old codger, and believe it or not, when I went to college, we actually had to physically go to the library to do research, as there was no such thing as the internet. So for me, doing research meant going to the library. I've always liked libraries and had a good association with them. Well, there I sat in the Juno Library, looking through Alaska tourist magazines and books about things like how to photograph the Northern Light. There wasn't much on Juno itself, and I was getting the impression that there really wasn't a lot to do there unless you were a cruise ship tourist and into shopping and eating out. I decided to see if there might be some old historical sites I could visit. I pulled some old history books out of the stack and kicked back, with the rain pouring down outside. It was kind of a magical moment, and I guess I felt transported back to my college days when I was getting my PhD in anthropology at the University of Washington. I had asked the librarian to see what kind of historical information they had about the area, and she came and whispered, how far back in history are you wanting to go? As far back as possible, I replied. Russians? Sure, why not? Alaska was originally claimed by the Russians, and hired Danish explorer Vitus Bering was the first to claim ownership on their behalf. He left his name on many landmarks, such as the Bering Strait. In 1867, the U.S. purchased the state from Russia for $7.2 million. The librarian continued, We have a book of the journals of George Steller, a German naturalist on Bering's 1740 expedition. He talks about their exploration of this area. I know Steller was considered the pioneer Alaskan naturalist, but I didn't know much about him. And we also have some of the writings of Aleski Chirikov, who was one of Bering's captains, she added. Before long, I was reading Journal of a Voyage with Bering, 1741-1742 by Steller. It was interesting, but I soon decided it was a bit much for the casual research I felt like doing. The librarian had also brought me the stuff by Chirikov, but it seemed like more of the same. I mean, it's all very interesting reading, but you need to be in the mood, not to mention sitting in a comfortable chair, which I wasn't. I was getting ready to leave when a younger guy sitting across from me asked if he could look at the Chirikov stuff. I guessed from his high cheekbones that he was a native. Who is this guy anyway? He asked. His name sounds familiar. I was surprised. The young guy looked like he'd be into playing video games more than reading hardcore history, but I told him what I knew. Oh, I know why he sounds familiar, the guy said. He's the captain who lost a bunch of his shipmates out on Yakobi Island, or at least that's where they think it happened. 
Where's Yacobi Island? I asked. And how do you lose your shipmate? It's almost due west across the strait from here, part of the Alexander Archipelago. And how do you lose people? Well, you send them off the main ship in a longboat looking for fresh water. And when they never come back, you send in more guys in your last remaining dory. Chirikov lost 15 men. Without his longboat and dory, the guys on the main boat couldn't get to shore and almost died of thirst. I was surprised and asked, how did you know all this? He gazed at me for a moment, then replied, I'm an anthropology student at the university. I'm also a tinglet, and Bering was responsible for killing a lot of my people. Our oral histories say that strangers landed on Takanis, what everyone else calls Yakobi. No kidding, I replied, feeling like I just won the history lottery. There's a place there with a lot of tinglet petroglyphs, and one has a big ship with two masts. There's also halibut and eagle petroglyphs and salmon. Have you been there? I asked. Yeah, several times. Would you take me there? It just popped out, and I couldn't believe it. I was asking a complete stranger to take me on an expedition to a remote Alaskan island, and I didn't even know his name. All I knew was that he was a tinglet and an anthropology student, but that was all I needed to know. I'm Hugh. I held up my hand. I'm Jackson, he replied, shaking my hand. People of the tides, I said, mostly to myself. Yes, the tinglet, Jackson looked surprised. I'm an archaeologist with the state, I added. Jackson smiled. I'll take you out, but you have to pay for everything. I'm just a poor student. Not a problem, I said. And you have to promise to not share what you see with anyone. I paused. What if it's of great significance? What if my sharing it would mean saving it? That seldom happens, and you know it, Jackson answered. You share things, and soon they're destroyed. You have to promise. No photos either. I was quiet. Jackson added, maybe I shouldn't do it. That way, there's no risk. I wasn't sure if he was talking about a risk for us, or a risk that I would betray his trust. Finally, I said, okay, I promise, but you don't have to do it if you feel uncomfortable. I know the petroglyphs are on Surge Bay, but nobody can ever find them. Have you tried? Jackson asked. No. Jackson said, I have to arrange a boat. It'll cost. My cousin will take us out. Give me your number and I'll call you later. I walked back to my hotel, feeling like I'd just been in an Indiana Jones movie scene the one with the unlikely meeting before some ensuing wild adventure. The odds against someone like Jackson and I meeting seemed huge, and yet they probably really weren't. I was in the history section of the library, so it made sense that someone else interested in history would be there. Southeast Alaska was the heart of Tinglet territory, and Juno had a college, so meeting a Tinglet who went to school there wasn't that big of a stretch either. And as an archaeologist, I had heard there were petroglyphs on Yacobi Island, though I'd never met anyone who knew exactly where they were. I'd heard of the lost village of Apollo Sovo, which was a tinglet village on Yacobi mentioned in a historical document which had never been found, although I later learned that there is evidence of human occupation near the petroglyphs on Surge Bay. Some think the village was the victim of smallpox, but after going there, I have my own theory, which you'll soon understand. In any case, Yacobi Island seemed to have lots of mysteries, and little did I know that Jackson and I were about to discover a few more. My time in Juno would be as far from boring as one could possibly get, and so the next day, I found myself on an old fishing boat motoring across cross sound, slowly making our way the 80-some miles from Juno to Yacobi. The weather looked good for once, but the currents looked tricky. Jackson assured me that his cousin Chris had fished there many times for halibut and knew where every rock and undertow in the sound was located. Chris had that air of nonchalance that one has 
who has done something a million times. I would be happy if he'd done it at least a thousand or even a hundred. The water in the sound was choppy, and I was happy to know a Coast Guard heliport wasn't too far away, over on Cape Spencer, though I later found out it's basically abandoned. Well, with maybe all of ten landings a year, mostly by rescue choppers, but ignorance was bliss, and it lent a feeling of security, albeit false, to what turned out to be an exercise by puny humans in a land of deep rainforest surrounded by even deeper ocean. I could eventually see Yacobi in the distance, a black mass against the dark ocean, and when it gradually came into better view, I could tell it looked black because of the density of its vegetation. Waves crashed endlessly against its high, rocky cliffs, lending an ominous, distant sound to the landscape. I suddenly felt like a fool to be out in such extremes with what basically amounted to two young men and an old fishing boat. We didn't even have adequate flotation devices as the straps were rotting away. We boated out from the sound to the edge of the deeper Pacific Ocean waters, obvious by the change of color from blue to black then turned south and began skirting the island. What I had seen so far of Yacobi Island made me think that no one in their right mind would attempt a landing there, with so many rocky points and cliffs and half-sunk rocky spires. And yet, that was exactly what we were going to do. I half expected to end up like Chirikov's missing men. It seemed obvious now that we were there that their boats must have sunk. Jackson assured me that he and Chris had landed several times in Surge Bay and knew the route well, but I felt a sense of gravity like I had been extremely careless in this particular undertaking. All I could do was hope I would live to regret it, like everything else on this trip. I later found out that Surge Bay is named that for a reason and is extremely dangerous when the tide is ebbing. In fact, a number of historians believe that Chirikov's missing men probably drowned trying to make landing. In addition, winds can quickly ram a boat into the rocks along the channel. If I'd known then what I do now, I would have never gone. But, like I said, ignorance is bliss. But even in my ignorance, I wasn't feeling very blissful. I had a knot in my stomach the entire time and instead of it going away, it only got bigger, even after Jackson and I successfully landed a small inflatable raft on the banks of a small cove inside Surge Bay. Immediately, something was telling me to get back in and leave, and the sight of a yellow inflatable kayak hanging high from a tree didn't help any. High tides here? I asked. Not that high, Jackson replied. I knew that there were places in Alaska that had 30-foot tides, but the kayak appeared to be tied up, not the result of being lifted into the tree by tide water. Someone tied it up like that, Jackson commented, examining the knot intentionally. Why would they do that? I asked. Bears, he replied, so they don't bite and puncture it, trying to figure out what it is. I thought bears can climb, I said wryly. Black bears climb. Brownies can, but don't like to. Have you seen brown bears here? I asked, my sense of doom growing exponentially. They're all over the island, Jackson replied. They're good swimmers. There's black bears too. I could now see that Chris, who had not entered the bay, had turned the fishing boat and was heading further south, going around the island. Hey, I cried. Where is he going? He's going to fish for a few hours while we explore, Jackson said. That was the only way I could get him to bring us. I thought I was paying him. That too. I groaned, then picked up my day pack, which held water, a rain jacket, a small first aid kit, a notebook, and some sandwiches and cookies, and no camera. Jackson tied the boat up to a large rock. How do we keep bears from eating our raft? I asked. We don't have any rope for hanging it in the trees. We won't be going far, Jackson replied. And I have this. He touched the stock of the rifle slung over his shoulder. We walked a ways down the beach 
and were soon standing by a round rock with a drawing of fish incised into it. The figure was old and faded, but obviously a salmon. And as we walked further, Jackson pointed out similar etchings on other rocks. An eagle, a sun, a halibut, another salmon, and then a small petroglyph that looked newer, not quite as faded as the rest of a sailing ship with two masts and what appeared to be four oars. I stood transfixed at what I knew was probably the only record of the first landing of non-natives in Western North America. I hadn't expected it to have as much of an effect on me as it did, but then I'm an archaeologist, so what would I expect? Things other people find boring cause me to tear up. Jackson seemed to notice. He said, I have something else to show you. It's very sacred, but I think you will understand. I wasn't sure what he meant by that, so I didn't ask. Where is it? He nodded toward the snow-covered mountains in the distance. Way up there. We don't have time, I replied. I told Chris we might go. He'll wait. It won't get dark for a long time. We're just going to that near one, the Big Ridge. Can we get back to Juno in the dark? I was feeling like the whole thing was going from sketchy to outright dangerous. No, we'll set anchor and sleep on the boat, but you must remember, we're the people of the canoe. My people floated and explored and lived here for many years before we had motors. We know the waters. Archaeologists like you say we've been here over 10,000 years. Some think much longer. I nodded, suddenly feeling very humbled and even fortunate to have been taken in by this young tinglet. We won't get lost, I asked, eyeing the thick forest. We'll use animal trails. What about the raft? It'll be fine, Jackson replied. I didn't know what to say, so I said nothing, wondering where the person was who owned the kayak hanging from the tree. Probably lost. We crossed the beach and immediately entered the dark forest. Jackson quickly found a rough trail that led through the trees. We startled a Sitka black-tailed deer which ran through the forest, and I was amazed at how quiet it was. I read later that we were near the West Chickagoff Yacobi Wilderness, which is part of the Tongass National Forest, the largest national forest in the United States, and part of Earth's largest remaining temperate rainforest. The trees are primarily western red cedar, Sitka spruce, and western hemlock. The average American has no idea that this forest, spread over thousands of islands, is part of their country. I certainly didn't. Jackson led as we pushed our way through the forest, skirting a large lake that he called Surge Lake. It opened into Surge Bay, so was salt water. We were beginning to climb, and the more we ascended, the less vegetation we had to deal with, until after a couple of hours, we stood on tundra at the top of the large ridge that overlooked the lake and bay. I could see the small cove we had landed in far below, our raft a mere dot on the landscape, the kayak above it just a yellow glint. I kept expecting to run into a bear, but we were lucky and didn't. I later read that the West Chickagoff Yacobi Wilderness is home to a unique group of brown bears that are more closely related to polar bears than to our other brown bears. Knowing how polar bears view humans as prey, I was glad we hadn't had the chance to see if these brownies had the same propensity. We walked to the end of the ridge where it plunged straight into rainforest, and Jackson showed me a large pile of gray rocks, many green with moss. The mound was obviously artificial, and I knew we were looking at a tinglet rock cairn. It had been built on the very edge of the mountain. Jackson looked thoughtful. Our oral traditions tell of an ancient flood. It drove our people from their coastal homes up into the mountains. We had to use rafts, and these rock cairns were used to anchor and save us. I nodded with respect. He continued, These stories are told by our tinglet elders and are passed down for generation upon generation. These cairns are all over the island here, 
and some places have as many as 30 or 40 mounds. Thank you for bringing me here. I can feel how special it is, I replied quietly, and there's an awesome view too. As I gazed back down to Surge Bay, my eye caught movement. Jackson noticed I was watching something and also looked. It's a bear, I exclaimed. Something large and dark was down by our raft. We watched as it appeared to be messing with the raft, though it was too far to really see what was going on. Being in the field a lot, I always carry a small monocular in my pocket, and I got it out. Something seemed very strange, and I watched as the bear, walking on two legs, appeared to be carrying our raft to the edge of the cove. It seemed impossible. Jackson, take a look at this. I handed him the monocular. He walked for some time, then said nervously, Kutsalan. Some call it Kushtaka, giant hairy man. I always thought they were just a myth, even though my grandfather said he had seen them. Big trouble. Hugh, big trouble. It just sent our raft out to sea. A chill went down my spine. Do you think the yellow kayak is still there? Jackson looked through the monocular for a long time, then said, it looks like it. Maybe the Kutsalan doesn't see it up in the tree. We both sat there in disbelief. A hairy man? I finally asked. Some old miner or hermit? I knew better, but I wanted to hear it from Jackson. No, Hugh, it's what some call Bigfoot or Sasquatch, or maybe even Yeti. Not a human, but very human-like. Very large and powerful and dangerous. Much worse than a grizzly, as it's much smarter and more cunning. Maybe we can both get out on the kayak, I said hopefully. Maybe, but what about its owner? He may not like that. How do we know that whoever put it there is even still alive? With that thing down there, what do you call it, Kutsalan? Maybe it already got him. Jackson looked even grimmer. I should have known better, he said. I'd heard they were on Chikagov and other nearby islands. They can swim. There are many islands and few people. Maybe that's what really happened to Chirikov's missing men. Kutsalan, I said. My grandfather thinks so, Jackson replied. Well, Jackson, you're the one who knows the territory. What now? Jackson held the monocular back up. After a while, he said, the raft's gone. I think it's been punctured, as it's not floating anywhere that I can see. The Kutsalan is now walking down the beach exactly where we went. It may be trying to track us. Do you think your rifle would stop it? I knew the answer. It just wasn't big enough for a creature that huge. Jackson replied, no, and we could never outrun it. Yakobi is about 80 square miles. It's too big to just hike across to another beach and hope someone sees us. Where is that thing now? I asked. Still on the beach. I was now wishing I had gone home after all instead of deciding to explore a place I shouldn't be in. The sun was now beginning to drop closer to the horizon. I really didn't want to be out here in the dark, and worse yet, I could see a low bank of dark clouds way out on the western horizon. I had carefully checked the weather before we headed out, but things can change quickly. Who knew if it was just a small squall coming in or a major storm? What will your cousin do if we don't show up before dark? I asked. He'll wait. If we're not back by late, he'll call the Coast Guard. He can't make a landing, as we have the only raft, or had, I should say. I said nothing, taking the monocular from Jackson and looking for the Bigfoot. It's gone, I said with a sinking feeling. I have a hunch, and it's not a good one, I added. Yeah, me too, Jackson replied. I really think it's tracking us and it won't be long before it's here, given its size. Would this sacred site provide us some protection? I wasn't superstitious, but I also didn't want to insult Jackson's beliefs. I added, maybe we should keep going. Go where, he asked. Think about it. We're on the top of a steep ridge. It's the best defensive place you can find, but also very visible, and if that storm comes in, might not be the safest. We don't have much time to act. If it is coming for us, Jackson said, standing. 
I think we may want to use humanity's oldest ally. Fire. Let's go. Jackson was now scrambling down the more gentle section of the ridge, and I followed. The ridge wasn't even close to being the highest on the island, and fingers of forest almost grew to its top. He was soon picking up pieces of logs and dragging them to the top of the hill by the cairn. I followed suit. We worked like madmen, dragging wood until we had a substantial pile. Some of it was damp, but Jackson assured me it would burn if it got hot enough. We could put the damp wood in with the dry and it would eventually catch. Now, Jackson said to rearrange the Cairns, making a sort of fort. I bit my tongue, wondering what the Tinglet elders would think of such desecration. The Cairn is sacred, and sacredness will provide us protection. There are many ways for such protection to work, Jackson said, as if he knew what I was thinking. I started helping Jackson stack the rocks, and we soon had a somewhat defensive structure, though it had no roof. We now dragged all the wood next to it, and Jackson stacked some into a pile ready to light. We're as ready as we can be, he said, sitting down on a rock inside the fort. We've been working for about an hour. It took us two hours to get up here, and the Kutsalan will be at least twice as fast as we are, so it should be here soon. We had worked so hard that I'd lost track of the time, but I could now see that the sun was setting on the horizon. I looked down the spine of the ridge we were on, wondering if the Bigfoot were really after us. If it were, it had to walk along the spine as the cliffs below the Karen were too sheer to climb. As I scanned the ridge top with my monocular, I saw movement. Sure enough, something was coming. I couldn't make out much, except that it was black. It's coming, I said. Jackson lit the fire with a lighter from his pack. I could tell he was a skilled fire maker, as he'd placed dry wood in the center, then surrounded it all with kindling and pieces so small they were sure to catch right away in a trail leading to the center. The fire was soon ablaze, lighting up the surrounding dusk. I thought again of Chirikov's men and then of Chris out in the strait, waiting for us, probably wondering what was going on. The fire seemed to have no effect on the dark figure, and if anything, it was now coming faster. I could see Jackson holding his rifle ready, though we both knew it would serve only as a deterrent if he were to fire it. As it approached, the figure was beginning to look human. I instinctively yelled, Hello out there. Who are you? Hey, a voice shouted back. Can I join you? Yes, come on, Jackson yelled. Hurry. With the suddenness that comes when one steps into light from darkness, the figure stood at the edge of our fort. It was a man, maybe in his thirties, dressed in expensive high-tech clothing. You know the kind that you pay a fortune to advertise their brand for them on your sleeve? He looked like he was about to collapse, so I motioned for him to sit on the rock he'd, I'd been leaning against. I thought I saw people over here, but wasn't sure until you lit your fire. I thought maybe it was another of those giant bear things. He was puffing, catching his breath before continuing. I've been on this damn island for two days, totally lost. I hitched my sea kayak up in a tree to keep the bears away from it, but now I can't find it. Every beach looks the same. Every bay, every cove, they all look the same. I was only going to explore for an afternoon. Would you happen to have anything to eat? I pulled out a couple of granola bars and handed them to him. We're running a little short ourselves, Jackson said, handing him a sandwich. We intended to leave about two hours ago. Have you had anything to drink? Yes, at least there's plenty of rainwater, the man answered, slumping down against the big rock as close to the flames as he could get without catching fire. Jackson kept feeding the fire while I nervously scanned the darkness along the spine of the ridge, watching for movement. The man said his name was Daniel, and he was a wildlife photographer from Calgary. He'd flown into nearby Sitka and had been kayaking his way around the many islands in the West Chickagoff Yakobi Wilderness, intending to eventually head over to Juneau. All his gear was in his kayak, 
hanging somewhere from a tree, and the story he told us next was chilling. He landed in the same little cove we'd used in Surge Bay, unaware of the dangers, and after seeing a big brown bear down the beach, he decided to hoist his kayak up in the trees. He then hung around, hoping to get some photos of the bear, who was salmon fishing in the rocks, paying him no mind. But the bear had stopped, turned its nose to the air, and suddenly fled. Daniel had thought that this was odd, especially since he suspected it was a male, who aren't afraid much of anything. He then figured a more dominant male was in the area, as grizzly males will sometimes kill each other. Sure enough, he spotted what looked like a very large bear standing back in the shadows as if not wanting to be seen. This really scared him, for he somehow had a hunch the bear saw him as prey and was stalking him. He wasn't sure what to do because he was completely unarmed and didn't even have any bear spray. The bear was between him and his kayak, so he slipped into the trees, hoping to somehow evade it. By then, he was terrified, as he could hear the animal following him. Daniel was a professional wildlife photographer, and he knew that even though black bears are good climbers, brown bears aren't. So, he decided to climb a tall cedar. He knew if he could get above 20 or 30 feet, the bear wouldn't want to follow him. After climbing a good 40 feet or more, he got afraid that he might fall and hunched back into the tree, watching and waiting. What he saw next was beyond belief. A huge animal with very thick shoulders walked directly under him, never looking up, continuing on. And even though he had his camera, he was afraid to take photos, as he didn't want the shutter noise to alert the animal to where he was. He said he was so shocked and scared that he spent the night in the tree, but the animal never came back. He finally climbed down and went back to the beach looking for his kayak so he could leave. But his kayak seemed to be missing. He paced the beach back and forth looking for it, then finally concluded he'd somehow gotten turned around and come to the wrong spot. He walked down to another small cove where he resumed his search. It was there that he found the tracks. They were not bear tracks, and they actually looked human, except they were huge and deep. This frightened him so much that he again fled for the trees, climbing as high as he could. It was now late afternoon, and after a while, thirst drove him back down. He knew he had to get away from the ocean and find some fresh water somewhere, so he began hiking up into the forest. Of course, it doesn't take long to find water in a rainforest. He stayed put by the stream, trying to decide what to do next. But he really didn't seem to have many options. He left his emergency personal locator beacon with his stuff in the kayak. As he sat there, he heard what sounded like monkey chatter, followed by what sounded like someone hitting a tree with a big piece of wood. Well, he was soon back up another tree where he spent his second night. By then, his desperation and hunger had changed to a real fear that he would die on Yakobi Island. The next morning, he again went back to the beach, but still, couldn't not, but still could not find his kayak. However, he did find something of interest, our tracks. That's when he decided to track us, but he also found that it's very difficult to track anyone or anything in a rainforest and soon lost us. He wanted to yell to get her attention, but he was afraid he would be found by the big black thing. So he trudged along, hungry and tired and scared. He finally decided to climb a ridge to see if he could spot us, which he did, the exact same ridge we were on. He had no idea who we were or why we were there, but he did know that we were his only hope for rescue. He said he nearly stepped off the narrow ridge several times, running to catch us in the near dark. Of course, it took Daniel some time to get his story out between eating and drinking and catching his breath. While he was telling it, I continued to scan the ridge to see signs of the creature as Jackson fed the fire. I finally turned my back to the fire, looking out the deep purple that was the Pacific Ocean. Jackson, look, could that be Chris? I could make out a small light 
that looked like a boat riding on the edge of Surge Bay. Jackson stood from where he was squatting by the fire and looked. It took his eyes a while to get used to the dark, but then he said, it's a plane or something coming in. I held out my monocular again, but it was too hard to spot anything in the darkness. I eventually saw what Jackson was seeing, and we both heard it at the same time. A chopper. Had Chris somehow called in an SOS for us? Soon, the flap-flap sound of two huge rotors became a deafening thump-thump as the chopper headed straight for us. It had seen her fire. I won't go into the details, but it was indeed a rescue chopper. A big Coast Guard MH-660T Jayhawk out of Air Station Sitka. And soon, our perch on the ridge was bathed in a blue light, followed by a crewman coming down on a cable us to assess our situation. Daniel and Jackson were soon on the chopper, each riding up in a basket. I went up last after carefully putting out the fire. It was quite the ride up in that basket, I can tell you. And just as we headed out, a heavy rain set in. We eventually ended up in Sitka, then Juno. Chris slept in his boat in the storm near Surge Bay, then motored his way back the next day in his boat. Daniel never did get his kayak back, but he didn't seem to care. And last I knew, he was headed home on a plane out of Juneau International Airport. I held up in my hotel for a day, then decided I wanted to go home for the rest of the time before the trial reconvened. I called Jackson and invited him to dinner at the Red Dog Saloon, where I handed him a wad of bills. He took them reluctantly, saying he was a poor student or otherwise he wouldn't accept the money, as he considered me his friend. I told him it was well worth it for the adventure, not to mention having a good story to tell. Besides, Chris needed to buy gas. But before we parted ways, I told Jackson I was a little disappointed, as I'd been hoping to see a Kutsalan close-up out there on Yakobi, even though I was scared to death. Don't be sorry, he said. Seeing one very close is considered to be very bad luck. Be glad you didn't. I guess that's good then. But one last thing. Did you hear what the Coast Guard crewman said after he hoisted me up? No. He asked me about the other big guy down there, back on the Ridgeways. Jackson looked shocked. What'd you say? I told him it was a bear. He acted like he didn't believe me, but when the chopper lights hit it, he quickly closed the bay and told the pilot it was all clear. I'm actually very glad I didn't see it. Yeah, me too. Jackson was quiet for a while, then said, Well, it's been interesting. Best of luck and so much for Yacobi Island. He nodded goodbye and walked out of the restaurant door as I ordered another bottle of Alaskan Hopothermia Pale Ale. On to the next one. The cold nights of October, coupled with the morning's frost, had me itching for the arrival of opening day for rabbit season, which began in November. There was a tremendous amount of land, both federally owned and state-owned, available for the hunt. At that time, a large amount of farming properties had already been abandoned and were being reclaimed by Mother Nature in the form of brush and briar fields, which made for spectacular rabbit hunting. I personally knew an old codger named Mr. Graves, whose family had owned a number of large land holdings in the region. He would allow me to hunt his properties in exchange for some field game. And it was that November had finally rolled around, and with it, I took my beagle ruffian out for the first hunt of the new season. I was working a 600-acre field that was once used for growing cotton, which was now comprised of waist-deep bramble and some thin trees. Mr. Graves would take out his tractor with a cutting attachment on it prior to the season opener and carve out several pathways around the field to aid in the hunt. On my first day in, Ruffian and I scored seven nice cottontails in four hours, and I made my way back home. The following day, we had a heavy rain, 
So it was two days later that I was back in the field on the hunt. Now, the area which I had gone into on this day was low-lying in the field. I mention this because the land from my position was elevated some 50 feet and going to my north about 300 yards. This concealed the rest of the field from my view unless, of course, I was to walk up this elevation. Ruffian was working the brush hard, and as of 8 a.m., I hadn't yet fired a round. It was windy and very cold. At this point, I was walking, cradling my Remington in my arms, heading in a westerly direction on one of the paths that Mr. Graves had cut through the bramble. The elevation with which I just described to you was on my right-hand side, being to the north. Suddenly, Ruffian let out one of his beagle howls. I turned my head to the north in response. To my utter amazement, standing directly atop this ridge some one hundred yards away from me was a huge, hairy man staring in my direction. Ruffian was leaping up and down and howling, but the beast just stood there unmoving. The growth in the field was uniformly about three to four feet tall, and at the distance I saw the creature standing, the brush was concealing its lower body to about mid-thigh. The creature stood its ground for maybe a minute as I attempted to calm Ruffian in a hope of not scaring it off, but such was not the case that day. No sooner had I calmed Ruffian down than did the beast turn and walk back out of sight behind the ridge. This beast was standing against the backdrop of an overcast sky amid a gray and golden yellow field of bramble and tall grass. This outline was almost black, and it had to have been standing some ten feet tall. I could see, even at the distance I was away from it, that its upper shoulders tapered up to what were the sides of its head. It appeared to be extremely broad and muscular with its chest being in a very distinct V-shape, and its arms hanging away from its sides. On the following day, having told Mr. Graves about what I had seen, we took the tractor back into the field and drove it through the bramble to the place where I had seen the hairy man. We could see the trail that it had made, parting the grass coming into the field from the wood line to the north. We followed the trail on the tractor and along the way, we came across a large pile of scat, which was not that of any animal in this area. It was comprised of large, long pieces that looked similar to that of a human's, only longer and wider in diameter. I realized that nobody is too keen on talking about scat, but as a hunter, scat is an important determining factor when tracking. Our morning ended with nothing else having been found. On to the next one. We have spent many enjoyable days hiking at Baoshin, which was at one time one of the largest cities anywhere on Oregon's coast. Now it is just a pretty park-like place to hike. We enjoyed many days taking our dogs with backpacks, carrying food, dog food, and plenty of water. We usually parked in the designated area on Tillamook Bay and hiked north following the road past where the Bayside Hotel and wharfs had been. We had made this trip about six times and were always amazed at the variety of birds that made their homes here. A Kansas City real estate developer had built a three-story hotel of concrete, a water system, concrete streets, dance hall, a huge natatorium, a railroad, and sold over 1,600 building lots, a wharf, and a town. Because of an error by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in constructing a single jetty instead of two, the Pacific Ocean had reclaimed every last sign that man had ever been here. Mr. Potter was so destitute over the loss of his dream that one night he walked into the sea and was never seen again. His creative dream was ruined. As we normally stopped at certain points for lunch and breaks, 
we seldom entered the rather large overgrown center part of this isolated peninsula. And where we crossed near Crab Harbor, this time we took a short trip into the forested area and followed the deer trails to a broad depression covered with an almost tropical type plant and trees. And it was welcome shade on a very unusually hot day for the Oregon coast. Suddenly, a large, brown, shaggy, bear-like beast stood up from a small pond, saw us, and made a sort of snort, and tore right up the massive sand dune behind it and disappeared over the top. We just stood there in shock, and even our two dogs didn't seem anxious to go after it. They just looked at us and barked. Neither of us could believe what we had seen, so... We went over and looked at the tracks that the animal left in the wet sand. One footprint was very clear, and it was about twice my size, nine and a half, and it seemed to have toes much longer than humans. We climbed up the dune, and the tracks went over the next one and around a large patch of bramble. Judging how fast it had run, we gave up and cut back to the trail that led to the jetty circled back to the ocean and went south to an oceanside beach trail that would lend us back to the car. As we crossed the beach to the trail, two hours later, we saw a footprint that was from the animal, plain as day, right along the wet sand, and it was headed down the beach. There was a narrow spit that it must have gone through to get to the other shore. That was the place where the peninsula was breached to turn Bay Ocean into a temporary island years ago when it was destroyed. We stopped at the Tillamook Police Department to tell them what we saw and just got a knowing smile and thanks for the report. But we hear about it each year at least once. It seems odd that something so strange and people just seem to accept it, but seldom does it ever get written up. And the explanation we were given is they don't want to scare tourists as their annual city income is realized over the four-month period when they have nice weather each year. We can understand that, being self-employed ourselves. On to the next one. Stories of the Bunyip, generally translated as devil or evil spirit began with the indigenous populations of Australia. According to the Dreamtime legends, the Bunyip is a river spirit that will eat anything too close to the river shore, including livestock and children. The lore regarding the creation of this beast states that a man named Bunyip broke the great law of the rainbow serpent by eating his totem animal. The good spirit, Bimey, cursed Bunyip into an evil spirit who lured its victims to it. An early account from 1847 describes the creature as such. Much dreaded by them, the locals, it inhabits the Murray. They have some difficulty describing it. Its most unusual form is said to be that of an enormous starfish. Common features in many 19th century newspaper accounts include a dog-like face, a crocodile-like head, dark fur, a horse-like tail, flippers, and walrus-like tusks or horns, or a duck-like bill, indicating that early colonialists may have been influenced by strange discoveries of the era, such as the duck-billed platypus and half-zebra, half-giraffe quagga. More modest accounts tell of a creature about four to five feet in length with the body of a calf or a seal and a head resembling that of a dog, as well as possessing long fangs and sharp claws. However, reports are not consistent across Australia, indicating possible misidentifications or even cultural memories. Some believe that reports of the bunyip are sightings of a living population of Diprotodon australis, the largest marsupial that ever existed. An example of the Australian megafauna of the Pleistocene epoch, the Dipstrodon is believed to have gone extinct about 46,000 years ago. 
The more conventional explanation is that the original tales of the Bunyip are about the last remnants of the Diprotron, which would have been alive at the time of the expected arrival of humans in Australia. Further reports, according to the theory, result of the cultural memory of the Diprodon. Paleontologist Pat Vickers Rich and geologist Neil Archibald also suggested that indigenous legends perhaps had stemmed from an acquaintance with prehistoric bones or even living with prehistoric animals themselves. When confronted with the remains of some now extinct Australian marsupials, Aborigines would often identify them as Bunyip. On to the next one. From the wilds of the Australian outback comes reports of a living Tyrannosaurus rex. An object of interest for young Earth creationists, the creature has also been studied in depth by Australian cryptozoologist Rex Gilroy, notably in his publication Burunjor, The Search for Australia's Living Tyrannosaurus. Gilroy recounts one supposed encounter with the creature. In 1978, a Northern Territory bushman and explorer, Brian Clark, related a story of his own that had taken place some years before. While mustering cattle in the Oropinja area, he became lost in that part of Arnhem Land. It took him three days to find his way out of that region and back to the homestead from which he had originally set out. He didn't know it at the time, but his footprints had been picked up and followed by two aboriginal trackers and a mounted policeman. On the first night of their search, they camped on the outskirts of the Beringer Scrub, even though the two trackers protested strongly in doing so. The policeman hobbled his horse, cooked their meal, and then climbed into his swag and went to sleep. Later that night, the two aborigines, shouting unintelligibly and grasping for their packs and saddles, suddenly woke him up. The policeman realized at this moment the ground appeared to be shaking. Hurriedly getting to his feet, he too gathered up his belongings. Shortly afterward, the three galloped away. The policeman told Brian Clark later at the Urupunji homestead that he also heard a sound, somewhat like a loud puffing or grunting noise, certainly loud enough to be coming from a large animal. When asked if he intended to include this in his report, the policeman replied that he would not because he feared that no one would believe him. The policeman warned Brian Clark never to return to that area because if he got lost there again, he would be on his own. The police would not come looking for him. Legends of a large bipedal creature also appear in the Dreamtime legend. Gilroy has collected pictograph artwork that seems to show the popular depiction of a T-Rex. On to the next one. Perhaps one of the most fearsome reptiles to ever exist. The Megalania was part of the megafauna that developed over the centuries on the Australian continent. The reptile is estimated to have been somewhere from 5.5 to 7.9 meters long, thus classifying it as the largest terrestrial lizard known to have existed. Feeding upon medium to large marsupials, the lizard was possibly able to run around 3 kilometers per hour. Some researchers have even suggested that, like its living cousin, the Komodo dragon, it could spew venom. The creature overall has been described as a giant Komodo dragon, supposedly driven to extinction around 50,000 years ago by other predators or the arrival of humans and their ability to utilize fire. Some have suggested a later date of extinction for the Megalania, based on the Bundelung National Dream Legends Dirawag, a god described as similar to a Megalania that gives the nation the tools and knowledge to survive. Based on the time of arrival of the indigenous populations of Australia, 
This could indicate a time of the extinction for the Megalania, around the end of the last ice age 12,000 years ago. On to the next one. Regarded as one of the fiercest creatures to ever exist, the Megalodon, a relative of the great white shark, is estimated to have been 10.5 meters long on average, with a potential maximum length of 18 meters. The species fed on large prey such as whales, seals, and sea turtles, while inhabiting warm coastal waters around the world. Fossils, predominantly teeth, have been found near Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, and French Polynesia. The creature, by all scientific estimates, went extinct 3.6 million years ago. Distribution patterns show that various prey of the megalodon experienced a boon from its extinction, with the great white shark extending into its former habitat. Supposedly fresh teeth, such as those dated as being only 11,000 years old from the HMS Challenger, seem to have found a lower rate of decomposition that made early dating process produce poor results. While sightings have occurred sporadically prior to 2013, belief in the continued existence of the Megalodon gained more widespread acceptance after Animal Planet ran Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives, which presented itself as a documentary that the shark could still be alive. On to the next one. I guess it started when Dad bought the painting. Now, my dad isn't an art expert, but he does love a bargain. He found a painting on eBay, an original piece that no one seemed to be bidding on. Dad snapped it up, virtually sight unseen. He spent days crowing about his great buy. When it was delivered a few days later, the first surprise was the size. Apparently, Dad hadn't checked that out. It was 24 by 36 inches, so not small. Mom was not happy, but Dad said he'd move some stuff around in the living room and there'd be space for it. While Dad had been talking, all I'd been able to see was the back of the painting. When he turned it around, I felt uneasy. The picture was of a young boy, about five, with short black hair, standing in front of a glass panel door with a female doll propped up beside him. On the other side of the door, pressed up against the glass panels, were hands, many hands. The whole image made me uncomfortable. The boy was frowning, looking unhappy, and almost aggressive. The doll had no eyes, just black holes. And the hands, well, they were quite disturbing, at least to me. Dad, however, was still thrilled. He kept going on about how lucky he was to get such a great piece, which apparently represented the line between fantasy and reality or something. He propped it up on an ottoman in the living room, saying he'd get around to mounting it on the wall one day. We'd all heard this from Dad before. One day could very well be no day. After dinner that evening, I happened to look at the painting again. The boy's eyes struck me. The more I looked at them, the more they seemed to suck me in. I stared. It was almost as if I was looking in a mirror. His eyes and my eyes felt connected. He blinked. I saw movement. My heart leapt into my throat. I wanted out. I wanted to back away, but I seemed rooted to the spot. I couldn't move. The eyes never left mine. What you doing? My sister's voice broke the silence and seemed to knife through the connection between me and the painting. I turned away and was overcome by a sudden feeling of dizziness. I dropped into a chair, careful to avoid any glance at the painting. My sister came up to me. You okay? You look terrible. Yeah, I just dizzy. I shook my head. I'd been up since early that morning, 
and I'd been out all day in the sun. Must be a touch of sunstroke or something. I grabbed a bottle of water and headed off to bed. As most people would, I rationalized that experience. I just assumed it was me, my mind playing tricks on me. I'll admit, though, that I always tried to avoid looking at the painting when I went into the living room. Even without that strange moment, the picture would have still creeped me out. It just had that weird vibe to it. It took me a while to realize it, but my sister was avoiding the pictures too. Now, I have to admit, we didn't talk that much. She's four years younger than me, which, given I was 15, was enough to make our relationship rocky at times. It's that family thing, being too similar and too different at the same time. Anyway, I noticed that she would always choose a seat and keep the painting out of her immediate sight line whenever she was in the living room. If she had to go across the living room, she'd always try to stay as far away as possible, even if that meant going well out of her way. Usually, if I'd noticed behavior like that, I'd have used it against her, teased her about it. That's what older brothers are supposed to do. Not this time, though. This time, I shared at least a little of her fear. One night, when her parents had gone out, we were sitting in the dining room, and I asked her about it. She replied, immediately and seriously. The boy is evil, she said. The whole picture is evil. I don't like it. I didn't laugh. Instead, I asked, why do you think that? She leaned across the table and looked me straight in the eyes. The thing it rests on. The ottoman. It moves, she whispered. I was going to laugh, tell her to stop trying to tease me, when I saw the look on her face. She was serious, deadly serious, and she was scared. When, I asked, when mom and dad aren't in the room, suppose no one's looking straight at it. It moves, it shakes, it's scary. I felt I had to do the big brother thing be the voice of reason. It could just be vibration, you know, if a truck goes past outside. She was silent for a few seconds. I could see a conflicted look on her face. I thought she was trying to process what I'd suggested. She wasn't. It's in my dreams, she whispered. What? I dreamed I was walking through the house. I came down the hall. The door to the living room was closed but a red light was coming all around it. I was going to open the door. Then, from nowhere, there was an angel standing there. He was tall, blonde, with big white wings and a sword of fire. He stopped me and said, do not enter the living room. Never at night. Well, that's just a dream. I was trying to do the big brother thing again. That's not all. There were tears in her eyes now. And she looked scared. I've seen the boy. The boy in the picture. Yes. I was sleeping. I felt something pull on my leg. It pulled stronger and stronger, shaking me. When I opened my eyes, I saw the boy from the picture. He was there, grabbing my ankle. I couldn't move. I was so scared. And then? I'm not sure. He turned his head like something got his attention then he disappeared, and I was lying in my bed. She was crying now. I tried to convince her it was all a bad dream, nothing more. But I was not convinced myself. I sat with her in her bedroom as she went to sleep. That night, only coming out when mom and dad came home. I'm not sure if I stayed with her because she was scared or because I was. A couple of nights later, I was home alone. The others had gone out to a birthday party for one of my sister's friends. Because my parents knew the friend's parents, they'd gone together. I had no interest in an 11-year-old's birthday party, so I stayed home. I was in my living room, online. I felt uneasy. My desk faces the window, so I sit with my back toward the door to my room. Every few seconds, I'd get that feeling that someone was out in the hall looking in at me. I'd turn, and of course, 
there'd be no one there. I was alone in the house. I couldn't shake that feeling though. At the time, I thought it was guilt. There are certain websites that a 15-year-old looks at only when he's alone in the house. I couldn't even concentrate on my surfing. I shut down the browser and looked behind me again. No one there. I realized that the house was silent. That seemed a little strange. Any house has some noise, and we lived on a reasonably busy road. I couldn't hear a thing. It was like something had muffled the whole world. It was uncanny. I concentrated, trying to hear anything. Then a scream split the silence. My whole body leapt out of the chair. It was a scream of absolute horror and fear. It sounded like the scream of a young boy, and it came from inside the house. It sounded like it came from my parents' room, but I was alone in the house, and I knew that. The silence again. The same absolute silence. My heart was still racing. My hands were shaking. I tried to get a grip on myself. It was just an illusion. Someone outside screaming, though I knew I'd heard the sound from inside the house. Maybe I'd fallen asleep in my chair for a second. I dreamed it all. Then I realized the house was no longer silent. I could hear the music, a child singing. It was quiet at first, but it started to build. My phone, maybe? Maybe I'd switched it to some dumb ringtone or something? I picked it up. The screen was black. I pushed the button. Still black. The music was getting louder. It was not coming from the phone. Nothing was coming from the phone. It was dead. I jumped out of my chair and dove across the hall into the bathroom. I slammed the door shut and quickly slid the lock. The bathroom is the only room in the house with a locking door. I huddled in a corner on the floor, my eyes on the locked door, as the music rose louder and louder. Then it stopped. Nothing. Silence again. Total silence. I was frozen in the bathroom. There was no way I was going out into that silence. No way I was going to see what was happening out there now. I started to relax when I began to hear loud noises again. The silence had gone. I stayed in the bathroom, though, till I heard the sound of my parents' car pulling up the driveway. Then I slipped out of the bathroom and back into my room to bed, though it took me a long time to get to sleep. The next day was sunny and clear. In the daylight, in the sunshine, all my fear of the night before faded away again. I told myself it was nothing. It must have been a dream or something. It couldn't have been real. As it got dark, though, my unease returned. There was a feeling in the house. It wasn't just me that felt it. We all seemed upset, easily annoyed, jumpy. My parents had a huge argument, something they rarely do. My father slammed the door of their room and my mother said she'd sleep on a sofa in the living room. My sister, desperate for company when she slept, said she'd sleep on the other couch too, to keep mommy company. I went to bed, feeling that the whole house seemed to be smothered in a haze of darkness. Nothing physical, but a suffocating feeling that seemed to have spread across all of us. Surprisingly, given my feelings and what had happened the night before, I fell asleep almost instantly. Later, I dreamed. I was standing in the hall just outside my room. It was our house, but it was wrong. All the windows were black, like there was nothing outside the house. Like you do in a dream, I somehow knew something was coming. I turned toward the stairs. The lights on the stairway were on, but they started to flicker, slowly at first, then faster, almost as quick as a strobe light. I walked toward the stairs and looked down. In the flickering light, I saw a small figure walking up towards me. I could barely make out his appearance. He seemed to be a young boy, but the colors were all wrong. His skin was gray, his clothes black, his head was down, so I couldn't see his face. Then the lights went off completely. 
I was left petrified, standing in the darkness. Then they came back on. The child was standing right in front of me at the top of the stairs. I knew he was small, but somehow he also seemed my height. I could look him straight in his face. His gray features were contorted into a look of hate and aggression. He hated me. I could see it. His eyes glowed yellow, and they seemed to be getting brighter, burning into my mind. My thoughts rushed back to barely believed religious instruction. In the name of Jesus, leave me alone, I shouted at him. He vanished. I was left standing alone at the top of the stairs. Then I woke up. My room was pitch dark. My heart was pounding, and I was drenched in a cold sweat. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to do anything that might draw attention to myself. The dream had felt so real, so true. Finally, I gathered my courage and reached for my phone to check the time. 3 a.m. I'd have to find a way to get back to sleep. Then, a scream ripped through the night. This time, I recognized the voice. It was my sister. I leapt out of bed and raced downstairs to the living room, arriving at the same time as my father. We both rushed into the room to find my sister and mother huddled together on the sofa, their faces white, their eyes staring. My father rushed to comfort mom, all thoughts of their argument gone. I hugged my sister, feeling her galloping heart through her pajamas. What happened? Dad asked. Not here, mom replied. At mother's insistence, we all moved into the dining room. With hot cocoa and coffee made, my sister told her story. She'd been asleep on the sofa. Something had grabbed her ankle and started pulling. She had an old blanket pulled over her face, but it had a hole in it, and she'd seen who was there. It had been a little boy, about five, with short black hair. His face, though, seemed to be falling off his skull. She said she could see bone poking through. His eyes were empty black holes. She'd closed her eyes, not wanting to see any more. Then it seemed to stop. And she felt like she woke up again. The boy was standing in the living room. He started to run faster than any little boy could, out the living room door, back in again. Then he stopped and stared at her. She said the stare felt evil, like she could feel the hate flowing off of him. Then she screamed and he vanished. Mother had been quiet through the story. She looked concerned, though. I asked her why. Your sister screaming woke me up. It gave me quite a shock, she said. Just as I was opening my eyes, just as I was waking up, I could have sworn there was another person in the living room with us. I didn't see him clearly, but just for a second, I'm sure I saw someone small standing there. All three of us turned to Dad. Get rid of that painting, Mom said. My sister and I nodded. Dad, to his credit, didn't argue. The very next morning, he took it in his car. On the way to work, he dumped it behind the old brewery. He said no one would ever find it there. I hope not. I don't want anyone else to go through what we did. Congratulations on making it to the end of today's video. Why don't you comment the color of your shirt down below to let me know you made it to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, Thank you so much, and until next time, bye!